Okay, let's, uh, let's start. Um, welcome to Drupal Architectures and Flexible Content. Um, thanks for coming. Just a short bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ernani. Um, I'm a technical team lead uh, for Acquia in, in Europe. Um, I am Portuguese and I've been involved with Drupal for a long, long time. Um, so I ended up doing a lot of things with, with Drupal. Um, mostly what I do these days is about Drupal architecture and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, yeah, my personal website and my Twitter feed uh, if you want to follow me. So let's start with, with the basics. So what's a typical website and why do we use typical websites to, or why do we use a CMS to manage those typical websites? So you have two types of content. You have structured content. You can think about news items or job posts or something that has a, a, a structured, um, a fixed structure and a fixed layout. So content editors typically do not change them. You create content and it just appears as it is. And then you have flexible content. So things like home pages or landing pages, collection pages, reach pages. Those are the ones that um, are very complex to build and those are the ones that can change per item. So you can have a content structure and you can have layout that changes according to those, um, to those items. And today I want to talk to you mostly about the second one. That's, um, that's where we find some, some problems. So today's session in the resume we can find it as architectures and patterns um, when we need to build flexible content that we need to worry about regarding content architecture, regarding layout architecture, uh, regarding workflow, and most important, how do you create a unified experience to manage all these? And when you think about the unified experience that you want to create, you want to create this experience not only for who is visiting your site, but most important, who is going to manage your site. And that person that is going to manage your site is supposed to be the content editors. So the content editors can vary in terms of demandings, can vary in terms of requirements, but they are typically a major stakeholder um, in websites where content is king. So imagine media, imagine entertainment, imagine corporate websites. Those websites have content uh, that change pretty often. For those websites, content editors want to change all the details how the content appears on the website. So it's not, it's not just required that the content can appear in the way that you design it, but things are going to change over time. So they want those flexible pages to be adapted. They want to be able to create rich pages. And they want to do all that without involving us, without involving techies, without involving site builders. Um, another important aspect that you need to think about the content editor is that typically someone that is technological savvy in his own way. So he knows that he can do stuff. He knows that he has done previous stuff in, uh, in other ways, in other systems. He comes from a technological background that might be different from Drupal. And you want to do exactly the same thing with Drupal. So that's another, um, another challenge. So if you find the demanding content editor, what are the typical demands that you can find and you, you might struggle with? So one is changing the website look and feel. So I want to have several available options and I want to change it as I want. Um, the other one is I want my content to be reusable anywhere. And that's a major, um, a major flexibility of using something like a CMS. I can create my content and then it can, it can appear anywhere where I want uh, as long as I include it. Um, more important, whenever I'm doing some changes, as I'm doing changes on very important pages on very important sites, I want to be able to review, I want to be able to preview, I want to be able to approve, um, I might even have more people involved in the creation of this content than just the content editor. It might be someone that is just creating content and someone that is approving that content. So there are different people and sometimes they don't have the background how that content got created. Um, sometimes you want to approve batches of content and you need to make sure that you preview it exactly as it's going to appear. If not, the experience is gonna be a bit broken. Um, some other times they want to schedule content. So they want to say, I want to prepare a special edition on my newspaper for next Sunday. Um, so I can prepare everything and I can just schedule it and I can approve it and when it's ready to be scheduled, when it's ready to be published, it's gonna be published at that time. Um, another major need that uh, content editors have on these types of websites is to readapt the site if there is a special event. So imagine if um, there is a major election or if there is a major sports event, at that time, you need to be able to um, add more content to the site and repropose the way that your homepage was done to bring more traffic to certain sections of your site that you want. Um, and uh, finally, 
the CMS should be easy to understand. It needs to, it needs to be very easy to create content, it needs to be very easy to reuse content, and it needs to be very easy to understand um, where is your content going to be and how do you change the layout of that content. So if you think about all these typical demands, and, and if you look to Drupal, you can find a couple of problems. So one of the problems that you have is that typically there's a disconnection between content and layout. You create a content type, then you create your nodes, and then the way that, that no those nodes get rendered, it's, it's a bit different. Um, you also have a disconnection between site building and content edition. So the way that sometimes you created a certain section, if it's, very, it's, very, um, if it's not very flexible, then it's very hard to change afterwards. Um, so the way that you build a site and the way that you edit the site is not the same. Then you have another problem, which is this old mantra that we used to have in Drupal, where you create first the content and then magic, automagically it appears somewhere else. So you first create the content and it appears either using views or either using um, any other type of display solution. Um, that content would appear in some sections of the site that have been configured to recognize that sections. Um, the other major issue, and that's, um, that's especially connected when um, when you think about all these demands about being able to review, being able to approve, um, Drupal lacks revisioning in many pieces of the puzzle. So you cannot do any revisions on things like blocks or menus or taxonomies. So if you, want to do, if you are doing changes there, it's quite hard to do the change as a whole and making sure that uh, it's easy to preview and you can see what's going on afterwards. So these are the typical problems that we are going to look today. And to solve those problems, as good engineers, you should be able to, to break them. So if you look to the different problems, I think we can look to four different types of, of problems that we have here. First one is content architecture. Second one is layout architecture. Uh, third one is how do you combine the two and you can provide some workflow and some, and some preview on them. And the fourth one, and I think it's as important as the, the other three that are techies, um, the fourth one is non-tech. So, um, what you need to worry about when creating this whole experience. So then in reality, when you deploy and when your site goes live and after two months, your content editors are happy and they don't say, well, this new system doesn't really work for us. We really prefer what we had before. So let's, um, let's look to the first one. Let's look to content architecture. And let's look at a very, um, a very easy problem, um, which is how do I create a rich page? So what do I mean with a rich page? So basically a page that has a structure um, that is a bit flexible. So imagine that I'm creating a page and I'm creating a recipe page. So in the recipe page, I can have images, I can have ingredients, um, I can have more images, I can have videos or tutorials, I can have all the instructions how to prepare this recipe. So when you think, and you know, depending on the recipes, I can have more images or I can have more videos or I can have more ingredients, and, and maybe they don't even want the same layout for everything. So if I am creating a recipe for a dessert, it's different from creating a, re a recipe for, uh, for a large dinner, for instance. So if the page is really flexible, and ideally what they want to do is just to be able to have a couple of things that they can add to the page when I want, um, and it's just a bit different than um, what you are usually um, expecting from just creating a node and having the node appearing somewhere. So what options do you have if you want to create these types of rich page? So there's first option. You create a free form HTML. Um, somehow you um, configure that, that HTML with, uh, with a WYSIWYG. Um, second option, you, um, you structure your content and you say, well, it's a recipe, so a recipe is going to have ingredients, it's going to have videos, it's going to have images, uh, it's going to have instructions. Third option is saying, um, I structure it, but I'm more interested on um, what I'm referencing than really the content itself. So I'm saying, oh, I'm, I need to first structure the ingredients, then I need to structure what is an image, what is a video, and then what I basically do is I reference from there. Or you have the fourth option, which is um, I don't reference at all from a content structure point of view. What I'm just creating is a rich page, is a white page, and what I want to have is widgets, and I just drag and drop those widgets on my page, and I don't really need to worry about if they are somehow connected or not from a content structure. So let's look to all of them. So first one, free form HTML. Typically this is never a good solution. Well, there's some options where you can have WYSIWYGs and then you can embed things from the WYSIWYG um, and you can configure this WYSIWYG. 
Um, in theory, this can give you a lot of flexibility. What happens in practice is that it ends up being very hard to manage that, uh, that content in the WYSIWYG. Um, and WYSIWYGs are not perfect, and they do have um, some usability problems as well. It's very easy for the content editor to break the whole page just by using the WYSIWYG. So it's hard. It's also hard to maintain the consistency. So by one side, it's nice that you give the whole flexibility, so it's just a white page. You can just put there what you want, but it's hard to maintain the consistency. It's hard if you, in the future if you want to say, I want all my ingredients to be linked to a supermarket page. That's hard to be done because everything, there is no structure there. It's hard to reuse content because you're just inputting content inside your major um, areas of, of text or major areas of, of fields. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very, it's very hard to, to avoid errors. Um, it's typically hard to, uh, to, to reuse. You, even with placeholders, even with embedding entities, it's, it's not that easy to, to make sure that the structure is okay, the preview is okay, the editing works okay. Um, it has the, the advantage that everything ends up being in the same, um, in the same block, in the same bucket. Um, so it's a bit easier to, to manage the content as a whole, but it's very hard to, to do changes there. Second option. Um, you create a content type, and that content type includes pretty much all the things that you need that content type to have. Um, so all the content details are stored in the content item itself, or in entities or in, um, in atoms of um, content that are referenced from that content, but only exists on the context of that content. Um, so typically, if you want to go with this approach, you have the typical implementation you'd have is either you create a custom field and you can use field API to create a custom field and have um, a field that is just a multi-field. You'd have ingredients and images, and or you can have something that is an ingredient and the ingredient has an ingredient plus the quantity. Um, or you do have other models that uh, allow you to uh, to do exactly the same, but in a much better way in the way that you are creating that content type or that uh, or that content structure. And that's that's when you use things like field collections, when when you use paragraphs which is basically, they are compound fields, they are fields that do have um, several values or several types of, uh, of subfields, let's say, and um, they are very easy to create. You can create them from the UI, um, and you can export them from the UI, um, and they typically have better connections as well with, um, with other models that control their layout and their workflow as well. Um, so one of the options that you'd have um, in this case would be to use a model called paragraphs, for instance, that was built for this use case. So in this case, you'd can, you can add paragraphs to your content. And you say, um, I have different types of paragraphs that I can add. I can add either text, I can add images, I can add videos, I can, I can add a collection of ingredients. All of those paragraph types, they are entity types. So they can have as many fields as you want, and they can have behavior as you want. Um, at the same time, they can have the, also the layout that you want. And you just need to think about it as, as a paragraph, as a, as an atom of content that I'm going to add to my pages, and then I can reorder, and then I can um, I can change the way that they behave, and they all they all behave in the database with a structure. So it's quite easy to integrate them with views. It's quite easy to use it as um, as content that is structured. At the same time, you can maintain the same user experience. You can maintain the same editorial experience for uh, all the types of content that you have as a paragraph. I don't know if everyone uses it, uh, paragraphs here. Any fans? Good. It has a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model that is not very old, but uh, got a lot of traction in the, in the last years. So third option, and this one is not very different from what we were talking about. The main difference here is that you, instead of saying that the entity or the atom of content that I'm creating, instead of living on its own, um, here it lives on its own. Well, in, in, when you use things like field collections and paragraphs, you are basically saying that that content atom works or exists in the context of the whole entity that you are creating. So it's almost like you have a host entity, and, and that host entity has several sub-entities. Here you are creating entities that are not connected um, directly with the main entity, um, but somehow have a reference there. Um, so for doing things like these, you typically use things like inline entity form. There's an entity reference between the two types of contents that you are talking about, and then you have some glue models. So you might want to have some back reference as well um, from, uh, from the, the sub-item or sub from the atom that you are creating. You want it to reference also the main entity, and you have models like content, entry or con content um, extra reference, which basically glues back to what you have. So and a good example of these is, for instance, if you are, uh, match, if you are uh, managing um, a football match and you want to have players, and those players have the time that they enter and the time that they exit the game, um, then you can have just references, and all of the addition seems to be happening in the context of the match itself. Um, but 
in reality, all of these are sub-entities which allow you to afterwards to do some queries on the database to see how many matches did the player play uh, and things like that. So it's, it, it's a bit more flexible if you want to have more um, definitions on, on the sub-atoms, more definition on the sub-items uh, sub that you are creating as part of the main content. So these are basically the, 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 the four options that you have um, to structure the content. I'm um, ignoring here um, the ability to, to just add um, widgets or just to add uh, content that is not referenced because that's not really related with content architecture. So let's look to our second problem. Um, so layout architecture. How do I create a rich page layout in Drupal? Again, the same problem. Um, you have created the content, you have created the content type, you know how it's going to be displayed. Now you need to think how am I going to style it? How am I going to display it and how I'm going to allow people to change it afterwards? So a couple of options that you might have. Uh, first one is just use the core template system. So you prepare your templates, you have very good um, control on what you're going to show in your markup, and somehow you pick those templates and somehow um, you assign the content to those, to those templates. Second one, you use something like display suite. So you create the same, the same concept, you prepare different templates, um, but then you can just drag and drop the fields where you want and you have control over the different view modes um, on, um, on those templates that you just created. Third option, uh, it's getting more and more popular as well, is to use panels and to use something like Panelizer to just provide some default templates that you have on your content, but at the same time allow you to override when you want. So let's look to the three of them again. Template system, um, like this is supported by Drupal Core. Um, you do have different templates and then somehow um, you pick the right template for your content. So you can have a custom field or you can have a custom attribute on your content and depending on that um, custom field or custom attribute then um, you pick the right template that you want to use. Um, it's a bit limited, like it's very hard to preview those um, when you are selecting them. You need to create some, some more custom logic here. And here you just, went, you just use what is default by, um, by Drupal Core um, and just use display modes and, and templates. Second one. Um, display suite. So basically the idea with display suite is that it allows you to easily customize different view modes. Um, so you can create for different entities, you can create view modes, um, and these view modes can be afterwards picked um, in what you want to show depending on, you can prepare the whole templating system, I can say a recipe, when I include it in the slideshow in the home page looks like this, when I, um, I'm looking to it in a full page it looks like that, uh, whenever I'm creating a, a grid of recipes um, it looks in a different way. So I can prepare different, um, different visualizations for my, for my same amount of content and, and then afterwards it's quite easy to maintain consistency across um, the different locations where this content appears. Um, all of these can be done by South Builders, so it's, it's a bit easier to create new templates or create new view modes and just allow them to, um, to be selected afterwards by content editors. Um, so I don't know if anyone here used Display Suite. Yeah, it's very popular as well. Um, this is an example of using uh, Display Suite, so in this case I'm creating um, a custom layout for uh, for a recipe and I can say I want to pick the three, uh, three columns layout. Um, and that is already customized so when I'm creating the content the editor can say I want to use three columns or I can use two columns or I want to use a big banner with some content behind. Um, so it's, um, it's also easy to create this type of content but you are more restricting in terms of flexibility that you are giving to your editors. It's hard for them to change this. They are, they will not, you are not expecting them to change this. So if there's a special event and they are asking for a new template that you didn't prepare, then um, you need to be involved at that point as well. Um, so that's the third option, which is panels. Any panel fans? Um, so panels can be, can be considered as uh, customized layouts that you can use for different means. It's basically a way of creating custom layouts for pages or for sections in Drupal. Um, they, do, um, they do have a good friendship with a, a suite of models um, that uh, extend their behavior in terms of recognizing passes, in terms of customizing uh, certain passes as well. Um, and what they allow is to create very easily a page uh, with uh, the layout that you want and at, just on that page drag and drop different components. Um, so it, they are quite easy to, um, to, be, to be created, they are quite easy to be um, customized. 
And it fits very well when you start thinking in an approach where what you want to create for your content editors is a set of widgets. And those widgets can be just drag and drop on different pages as they want. So if they want to create a recipe, they can just drag and drop components. And, or if they want to create a home page of recipe, they can drag and drop components and then customize as they want. So, but if we look to panels, there's not also a very um, straightforward way of creating a page with panels. You can actually look to different ways of creating a page with panels. Um, you can create independent panels, so they are just panel pages. Um, you can create a page manager and have variants. So I can create a page manager a variant that overrides the nodes, um, the node view um, variant, and I can create different variants on that page manager. Um, and then depending on an attribute, it picks one of the or another. Um, I can have panel nodes, which are just panels that, uh, the, the node that is attached with, with the panel. Or I can use one of the, the most recent additions to the panel suite, which is Panelizer. Any fans of Panelizer? Okay. So the basic idea with, with Panelizer, it's, it's just a way of gluing a panel to an entity. Um, or, or to an entity view mode as well. Um, so you basically create your panels, you create your displays, and then you can say, I want, anytime I'm viewing certain entity in a certain view mode, I want it to be rendered through this panel. So, and also, the other thing that it provides by default is that you can define several templates, you can define several displays, and those displays can be used as templates. So I can say, for recipes, I prepared you all these five templates, but if you want to override it, if you want to create it your own, you can do it as well. Um, it, what it does, it's basically panelizes an entity. So whenever you are viewing an entity, instead of going through the normal render of that entity that you would uh, that you use normally, instead of that, it's going to render a panel. And then you have all the benefits that you'd have from using panels, um, just rendering that entity as well. It has a very slick interface when you combine these with panels IP, so panels in place editor, which provides you a different types of interface to manage your panels. So if you have to think, I want to expose the panels interface, the default one that you get when you install the model, to your content editors, that's not gonna work. It's, it's a very complex uh, interface. You have this notion of variants, you have this notion of having the different widgets, the different widgets that appear is a long list, it's, it's very hard. But if you start playing with things like panels IP, which is just in-place editor, you have just a, um, a quick button that says, I want to customize my page. And here is your list of widgets that you can add. And you add those widgets to the page, and then you can configure those widgets. So you can say, I want to have a slideshow, or I want to have a grid, and then I want to pick node one or node two, or node that goes through a browser, and then I pick the right node. That's much easier to um, uh, to expose to content editors. That's much easier to explain to content editors than going through the normal panels interface. So, and you can try this all this notion in distributions like Panoply. They were the the first distribution to glue all really this concept together and having this concept of I can create rich pages with panels and, and panelizer, and I can override when I want, and I can still have templates available for them when I didn't override. And I do have a list of very well prepared widgets that they cannot mess up. So they can have, they can have a gallery, they can have a slideshow, they can have a map, they can have a list of links. All of that is sought from the beginning, and that's how the widgets that they are going to add to the rich page that they want. Or Lightning as well. Lightning is a distribution um, from Acquia um, that glues a couple of things together um, in terms of in terms of a CMX experience that Drupal out of the box does not provide. Uh, one of them is uh, is Panelizer, and it also integrates very well uh, with Panelizer and Workflow, which is the next topic that we'll talk about. Um, the other missing um, piece on this puzzle of using uh, panels and, and using Panelizer um, is panes. And panes, you can think of them. As, as widgets, so things that you add to your pages. Um, in, technically, there are C-Tools content types, um, and so there are constants or boxes that you can add to your pages, um, and you can customize them. They can have configuration. That configuration is also per instance, so anytime that you drag a box or a widget or a pane to, um, to the page, you can configure that widget, um, and that configuration is by page. So anytime that you create the same widget in another page, you can have more configuration. And that's very important when we start thinking about workflow, and you'll see why in a bit. Um, 
You have other uh, interesting um, models that glue very well with this whole concept of, of panes and, and, and using panelizer to add those panes to, to the pages. Uh, Fiddle panel panes, um, it's a model that allows you to create entities um, that are very easy to be customized in panelizer concepts. So they're just normal entities. Uh, you can create bundles on those entities, um, and then you can just drag and drop them um, in the pages. So if you look to Panopoly or if you look to Lightning, all of those things like maps or slideshows or a list of links, all of them are Fiddle panel panes. And they are very easy to, to be created. They are normal entities, so you have all the nice things that you have when you use entities. Um, panels in place editor we already talked about. Two other things that I wanted to talk about that came from, uh, from Panopoly. One is Panopoly Magic. Uh, what it allows you to do is whenever you are editing or whenever you are adding a pane to a page, Panopoly Magic allows you to preview it automatically as you type. So basically you are typing, I want to create a list of links or I want to customize a map and you type on it and you just, you can see on the, on the right side of the, of the widget, you can see how is it going to appear. So it's very easy as well to create a very good experience for your editors. They can see what they are creating. They don't need to create the content first, save it, preview it. No, they can create the content, and as they do it, they can see how it is appearing. Um, and that works, uh, that works out of the box with Panopoly, but it's, as itself, it's, it's, just a custom, it's just a country model that you can just use on its own. Um, the other one is Panopoly widgets. So if you want to create your own widgets, and if you want to drive your editors and you drive your content strategy to grow with, with this Panopoly or with this widget approach, then you have a couple of widgets in Panopoly that you can use as, as base, as things that will guide you to see how they have done it and how could you do it as well. So for the ones that never used um, Panelizer, um, this is um, an example of how would you customize a page in Panelizer. Um, so you just have a, a little bar in the, bo in, the, in the bottom that says, I want to customize this page. The page is already a panel, but I can add more things there. Um, and then in the left sidebar, whenever you want to add a widget, you have a bunch of new widgets that you can add, namely tables, namely maps, um, any type of widgets that you can think about, you could customize it that way. So it's very easy for them, instead of thinking about, I want to create some text and that's very complex, now I can just go there and create the entity directly on the content of the page. It's much easier for them to understand that than create the content elsewhere and then just referencing it somehow, especially using an entity reference that just has an autocomplete. It's a very different experience. And it can break our old mantra of saying, you create first the content and then you reuse it. No, you can create everything in the same place and it kind of makes more sense from a content edition perspective. So this is nice from a, a layout perspective. Um, so we do have several options in terms of layout. We do have several options in terms of content. But the third thing that typically this type of content editors want and this type of sites want is a good workflow. Um, it's, it's in, a, in a newspaper, in a, in a magazine, in a TV, typically all those content needs to be reviewed. Typically all those content needs to be curated. Sometimes there's, there's content that is just sitting on a CMS for months uh, until it's published because it's just prepared to us for a special occasion, for instance. So it's very important that you also think about the workflow and you also think about the preview experience. So whenever you are creating these type of pages or these collections of pages, you also think about how are you going to approve it, um, how are you going to preview it, and if you need to revert or if you need to reject some changes, that does not change what is in production. So how do we workflow content and layout together? So content is easier. Content has been something that we have been working in Drupal and workflow in, in, in Drupal is something that came from a very long time ago. So you have models in Drupal 7, like workbench moderation that appeared first or workflow that appeared later, um, that provide a very, good, uh, a very good solution on how do you workflow that content. So you do some changes, and that change gets to a certain stage. Some role in Drupal would look to that content and see, okay, this is good to go, this is not good to go. And if it's approved, it gets published and it starts appearing on a certain site. Layout, it's a bit more difficult. So if you, have, if you start thinking about, I have all this concept of widgets and I added this to a panel, um, and, or I do have um, some changes on the layout between one revision and another revision, it's a bit more tricky. Um, and you don't have many models that would work well together, um, and here are where the problems could start to, to appear. Also, if you do have content that is not really exist as a whole, if you are thinking about flexible content and the content on that page can appear from 
many, many locations, it's a bit hard to preview because you need to make sure that you are pointing exactly to the right direction. You need to be pointing to the right revision. So if there was a change on a certain piece of the content in some, in some sub-item of content, um, that needs to be reflected only in the page that you are seeing, not in the ones that have not been approved yet, for instance. And then you have all this problem of reusable content. So if I have content that is reused across different pages, I need to uh, alert users or I need to alert editors that whenever there is a change, and uh, that change can be, um, can be appearing as well in other pages, and maybe that's not what they want. Maybe they just want to change it on that specific instance. So typically, if you want to preview content, it's much easier to, um, to preview it if the whole content exists as a single unit. So it's just one single unit of content, and whenever the, the node is being loaded or whenever that entity is being loaded, it all belongs together. It's much harder to achieve if you have a lot of entity references, for instance. Entity references do not reference revisions in Drupal. They reference entity IDs. So it's much harder to say, I want to reference the change that I have done um, that is not published yet. I want to, to reference the change that is happening for the elections of, of Sunday. It's much harder to do that. Um, it's also easier to achieve if whenever you are customizing your layout, all the changes that you want to do, all the changes that you are doing on the configuration of certain entities or certain widgets in this case, um, they do exist in the concepts, in the context of the widget itself, of the instance of that widget in that page. And that's where, um, that's why I'm defending that using panel panes, it's, it's typically a good solution because that configuration is safe per pane. So it's and it's safe per, per page. So it's much it's much easier to um, uh, to interact with with that with that pane, and it's much easier to make sure that whenever you are looking to the next revision, that configuration is changed there. There is no cross references basically between the two panels. And also, if you think about workflow, there's typically two solutions to this in in CMSs. In if you look to different CMSs over history. Um, you have systems like Drupal where typically you end up doing directly in production. Um, so you go to the production website, you create the article there, um, or you create some, some content there, and, and that content um, can be can be revision, can be uh, can be approved, can be published, um, or you can have different environments. You can have systems that defend well. We should have a pre-production environment or a content production environment, and then that's where I create my content. And um, after they have done a couple of changes, then I can just press a button and that goes to production magically. Um, so both are possible in Drupal, um, and there are clients that have explored both possibilities using different models. Um, the first one, it's it's more limited um, if you don't if you don't address it well. You need to think about the whole concept of the workflow, the whole problems of revisions, the whole problems of references. Um, and you need to be looking to models that integrate well with each other or models that work well um, from a holistic point of view. Um, so if you work to panelizer and Workbench, then you start having a problem because typically what you are approving uh, with Workbench moderation is just a change on the node and the reference to the panelizer is, is, is unique, is single. But then you do have some work done on, on the community and you have some patches um, that would get you that, uh, that behavior out of the box as well. If you want to look to different environments, it's, um, it's a bit cleaner. Like whenever you are looking to an environment, that environment contains all the changes that you are doing. But then it's not that easy to deploy that content to the next, next environment. You don't have that um, huge support on many entities and many dependencies on those entities to make sure that you have done a change in a pre-production environment and you click a button and magically that appears on the production environment. So if you are doing directly in productions, models like um, quick edits and panels in places gives you a lot of uh, editing context um, behavior. And that's interesting whenever you are looking to get an, exp an experience where you want editors to go directly to the, set, the content where it's appearing and fastly change it and do not worry about what's behind it. Um, and if you are working in, in the same environment, then you'd be working with models like Workbench or Workflow um, or workbench moderation or workflow, and that would guarantee you that um, that behavior in terms of revisioning and that behavior in terms of approving different content. 
And then you have some experiences and, and some projects like the site preview system uh, that try to glue the whole thing together and tries to um, get you also some more uh, support for things like I want to create a section or I want to create a batch of pages and I want all those pages to be approved at the same time and changing everything at the same time. Um, so you would always, depending on the revisioning system and then some custom or some country models that would customize that experience around it. If you are looking for different environments, then you typically are looking to move information from one environment to another. Uh, so there are different ways of doing that again. Uh, one of the options is to use the deploy model. It contains um, very interesting support for dependencies. Um, so you can do things like I want to push my node, and somehow I want to push also the reference of my node, or I want to push the images that are attached to my node. Um, but then it, it might lack support in some, in some other areas. So it's, it's harder to export things that are not content, that are not entities. Um, and it's harder to support things like panels that are associated with a certain content. Um, so it's, it's a bit harder to, to, to pick the second environment or the second, the second approach. So using different environments is possible, but it's a lot of work. And you need to be thinking again in your architecture very, very closely um, from the beginning. Okay, so we look to preview, we look to workflow. The last bit is, even if it's the last, I think it's one of the most important, it's all about non-technical considerations. So the, I think the, the most important part here and, and where I sometimes I see struggles from um, content edition teams is that they are not usually um, exposed to the project since the beginning. Um, they are the ones that are going to use the site every day. They are the ones that know what kind of content are they going to create. They are the ones that have the needs. So they need to be involved from the discovery phase. They are one of the major stakeholders to be involved since the beginning. And not only in UAT, it's, it's very hard for them to just be trained after you created a concept that it might exist on someone that was driving the solution from the client or from your head or from your previous experience. But all the content edition teams have different requirements. They do have different ideas. Sometimes they can be adapted, but it's important for them to be involved since the beginning. So then your system really captures what they want to achieve. That's the only way that your system is gonna, live, is gonna last four, five, six years, is to make sure that it supports pretty much all the requirements that they had from the beginning. Um, another important um, item in this slide is making sure that you understand what's what they care about is what they see. They don't really care what's in, in the back. They don't really care about how Drupal does revisions, how Drupal does, um, how the, does the workflow, how Drupal does inclusions of content. The most important part for them is to be able to quickly create content, quickly manage that content, quickly edit the content that appears in a certain page. It's important to consider history as well. So they come from a certain background, they come from certain platforms, um, they might come with an environment that used to have a pre-production environment, then you are trying to move them to a new world where everything is gonna be managed in production directory. It's important to make sure that they understand those implications and they, they are comfortable with those, with those changes. The other thing that is very uh, important and is, is, a, is a very good advice that I typically give to my clients is to pilot and PLC as much as possible. So try to expose them to pilots. Try to expose them to the way that you are um, suggesting that their new world is going to be. Create a quick PLC, create a quick pilot, make sure that they are comfortable with using uh, panels and panelizer, even if the experience is not the same that they're gonna have in true production, make sure that they are comfortable with what you are going to see. And it's also important that that same experience is the one that you demo from the original interactions with the client. So that's one of the reasons why Acqui created something called Demo Framework, why we created the same, it's a one solution that we show to clients that's where they can recognize um, what Drupal can do out of the box and drives them as well in the way that they manage content. And that's the same expectation that they're gonna have when we deliver. And distributions like Lightning, Openopoly, I think they are great inspirations on models to start with, if you wanna go with, with a panels approach. And there are other ways, of, there are other models that you can, you can follow, but again, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Typically, you need to look to the whole problem as a whole, and there are people out there that already solved it, so make sure that you look to those examples as well. And that concludes my, uh, my presentation. So this is basically the idea that I want to pass you here is that whenever you are creating and whenever you are analyzing this type of problem, you need to have a holistic view. You don't need to, you need to only, not only worry about the content structure, but think about the whole implication. Structure, layout, workflow are the three major ones that you need to think when creating and managing content. 
Fort one is important as well, and, and Drupal sometimes lacks this nice editor experience or this nice user experience. It's an area where we are somehow behind from, from, uh, from other systems. But somehow, sometimes it's quite easy to just do a quick trick, just do a quick change, make sure that you hide buttons, make sure that you just provide editors what they need to see, and make sure that their, their experience when managing the site is as flexible as possible. Just to finish, um, a couple more about my, my work. Um, I'm a technical architect in Acquia is responsible for designing solutions like this from beginnings to, to the end of the projects. So we typically involve from the discovery to definition of the solutions um, to development phases to deployments. Um, most of these examples that I gave you here was projects that we work in the past. So if you are interested on um, uh, working with us, we are hiring. Come, come to the site, see the, what positions we have available in different, um, in different departments and come to talk with us. And that finished my presentation, so I'll open for, for questions. I'll ask anyone that has a question to go to the mic, if possible. Uh, hello. My question is about using paragraphs and panels in one solution, I mean one website. Uh, have you used them together, and how? And uh, is that actually a good idea or not? Well, you can combine different approaches that you have here. You can combine panels in display suite, and you can combine paragraphs in, uh, and panels. Typically, when you, have, when you give too many options to your editors, it's very easy to confuse them as well. But you can think of ways of creating paragraphs as a, as a certain amount of content, and then just using panels to combine rich pages. So maybe the way that you are creating recipes or the way that you are creating stories um, or news stories, for instance, is different from the way that you are creating a home page. Um, and what you want to have in a way to manage the home page is very different from what you want to want to use to create a story. Um, but typically, I try to stick with one approach. I try to make sure that the approach is holistic. Uh, it's easy to explain. It's easy to document. It's easy to train people. Um, and the complexity of the overall solution that you are creating is also lower. So if you need to update the amount of mods that you have, it's much easier if we just drive uh, everyone in the same direction from the beginning. But again, it really depends on, on the use case that you have. Um, it really depends on the flexibility that you want to have in landing pages versus and the creation of things like stories. Hi. So you're an architect, um, and um, you figure out um, sort of the structure and architecture of different pages, fields, and so on. So where do you feel that um, your job ends and the developer's job begins, and in your daily job to work hand-to-hand uh, -hand with the developer every day or do you give like a larger piece of architecture for the development team and then sort of step away from that? Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, an architect needs to follow the solution that he design. Um, the solution that he design most of the times is going to change over time. There's new fields that can come, there's new requirements that have not been discovered during the initial phase, so it's very important for for him to be very close to the architect, to the development team as well, and to be close also with uh, the, the end client or the, the people that is owning the product itself. Um, I think it's very important to follow up the solution. It's very important to see what's the end result. And it's very important to be involved in, in situations where the original solution is going to change. And over time, the solution always change. It's very hard to define your content structure in the beginning of a project. You don't know, you are going to miss areas. So it's very important to prepare for failure, making sure that you prepare for that complexity, and making sure that you are there as well when those changes will come. Uh, first of all, let me to thank you for this session, because uh, this was a really huge problem in Drupal for all of the time, about creating rich content, I mean. Uh, so, uh, what about my question? I don't really have a question. I want to propose a solution, if you to let me to do so. Yep. And could you please move back your slide to option B? In, uh, in layout the, or in content? The part. So, content, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I want
want to suggest uh, to not to split option B and option C. So if you can switch a slide, please. Uh, option B is about including content right in the node or entity, uh, and option C is about referencing content on the page. So uh, what I suggest to do, I suggest to combine all of two options together so you can reference content at the same time and include it in the page. So it gives you flexibility so you can reuse content, you can manipulate it, and using uh, references dialog module, you can edit in the inline. So mm -hmm. it's really, it's really, it could be really easy to manage your content in the way you want. Yeah, I think the, the flexibility that you have when you go with option B is that in reality of those compound fields or those, those subfields, they can, they are just normal fields. They just depend on field API. So one of the fields that you have there as part of your sub item can be a reference. So you can do a paragraph that references other paragraph or a, ref or a paragraph that references an entity that is somewhere different. Um, it's a bit harder to combine the same behavior of inline entity form with something like paragraphs or field collections. It's a bit, it's a bit different. Uh, and one more aspect of that. Uh, so we can try to do not separate a layout and content. So we can treat content and layout both as a content. And uh, uh, it will allow us to use uh, the same things for layout and for content. So uh, instead of separating this thing, we can uh, treat both of them as one uh, thing. And uh, for example, use paragraphs or something like that for designing your layout and pages and it could be really easy to do. Actually, uh, I just implemented a module uh, on top of entity reference module and ECK admin UI. Uh, this n the name of the module is just atoms, and uh, it combines option B, option C, and uh, uh, all your part about the outer architecture. So if That's cool. what's the name of the model so then people understand again? Atoms. Okay. So if you're interested, you can uh, join my both. Uh, it will be in 132, right after this session. Okay. So anyway, thank you for your session. It covered uh, many things. And uh, maybe you know about atomic design concept. Mm -hmm. This is about, uh, not just about Drupal, not just about content management systems. This is, uh, is about a new concept in design overall. So it's really, it's a, it's a good concept which describing uh, everything you sp we spoke about today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say um, I work with paragraphs and also with inline entity form for the same purpose. And the main difference from the user perspective is just that in inline entity form, you need to save each sub entity. Hmm. But internally, even paragraphs, and I think also uh, field collection just stores separate entities for each yep. uh, yeah. item. So they are different entities. Technically, just it's just kind of the same. It's just a different yeah. integration with the field API, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different interface that you have to edit those. But, but I think it's a good idea to choose just one of those two things. Right. Either your fields are entity uh, references or they are paragraphs. You can combine them. You can make nested structure, mm -hmm. which some of them use paragraphs, some of them use entity reference. But I think it's probably s easier if you just stick to one. Yeah, I agree. Hola, Hola. Um, <laughs> my question's kind of simple. Um, Basically, I hate all of you that you just spoke about. <laughs> it looks freaking ugly. Uh, it's, they're basically all X on top of Drupal, which is option A. Yep. And, um, and we're going to have Drupal 8. So how would people that are here working with Drupal 7 better prepare their sites using those options to move to Drupal 8? Because it's going to be a nightmare. A lot of what you do there might not be have an upgrade path. True. Um, I think most of these solutions that you have here in, in Drupal 8, you'd have them, um, you'd have similar solutions. It's very hard to predict um, an upgrade path, but if you look to what's happening in panels, if you look to what happens in display suite, um, you'd probably have path upgrade passes on those on those ends. Um, the other thing that is interesting in Drupal 8, if you look to all the media initiative, is the way that you're going to have much easier to integrate other entities in WYSIWYG via placeholders, which is a solution that right now in Drupal 7 is um, is a bit um, weak, I would say. Um, but yeah, one of the problems that you have when you think about migrations is um, you, if you don't 
save the structure of your content. If you don't know from the main content what are you referencing, then, or if that reference is something that is weak, um, saved in uh, C tools content type or something like that, um, it's, it's much harder to, to migrate in the future. Um, so I would say that at this point in Drupal 7, there's a couple of options that are very well defined. I wouldn't try to move away from any of those options. Um, for Drupal 8, it's, it's, it's hard to predict what will happen. Um, I think both display suite and, and, and panels and panels and, and panelizer eventually uh, would depend from the same um, the same rules. Would depend from the same uh, layout plugin. So it's it's a bit easier to understand and to prepare for that if you go with that approach. Um, and I think things like paragraphs and field collections will still be there. Um, um, they're providing exactly the same the same the same things that they provide in Drupal seven. Uh, just a quick question: Which entity type do you use to uh, with entity reference? Do you use nodes or something different? You can well entity reference. You can reference any type of entity. Um, so it really depends. You want you might want to have an entity reference that uh, reference your custom entity, or you can have entity reference that reference any node or any that you want. It depends on what you're trying to to reference. Uh, thank you, Nani. Uh, just to answer your question before. Uh, there's um, tomorrow a session which is called Building Sites in Drupal 7 with an eye on Drupal 8, which might be interesting for many of you. Okay. Hello. I can throw one more remark. Uh, based on my experience working with some compound fields like multi field, not always is a good idea. And um, let's see. I forgot. <laughs> Mm. Sorry, I had one more. No, it's okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, great presentation. Um, yep. Yeah. Stuff for the mind. Uh, we use a lot of uh, paragraphs together with uh, references. Uh, I want to say that the Paragraphs module fixes a lot of stuff, field collection uh, can't handle. It's a Dutch company that did it, VDMI, mm -hmm. and he ported it for Drupal 8. <coughs> it's going to be there. Um, it's going to be great. You use it. Uh, we have like an extra um, uh, cool thing we did. Uh, when you create paragraphs, it's <coughs> the editor just wants to see how it will look. So we made like a button that displays. Uh, this is like, uh, you know, three paragraphs mm -hmm. side by side or pictures and you can just click on the button it will create it they fill it yeah it works awesome that's cool thank you okay it came back <laughs> <laughs> so um, for people who are moving from Drupal 6 to 7 and are planning to, Drup to Drupal 8 well um, regarding panels some components are, are currently being deprecated that's for example panel node yep and also custom custom content panes, uh, which can be replaced by fieldable panel panes. Mm. So that's just it. Um, just wanted to give this remark. Yeah, typically when you evolve from one major version to another, you need to think of what are the things that are deprecated and just move them. Some of them will need to be rebuilt. It's going to be hard to move things like um, something that you have done in the custom implementation of panels. OK, so when I started with uh, um, entity reference and in an entity form uh, approach, I wanted to have an entity type that is really um, lightweight and not like nodes with the, which kind of comments and everything. Mm -hmm. So I created a small module that just defines this kind of entity type and yeah. I called it nested box. And okay. I just wanted to mention that. Like, but I, at the moment, the I cannot really say if I recommend the paragraphs or the other approach. Paragraph so seems to be more dependent yeah. for and this so maybe I just stick to that and then I don't have to care about this other yeah. model. But it kind of I think it works. So yeah. Okay. No more questions. I think we can finish. Thank you.